Association here at Bradley. Um, this is an event hosted by Gain Peace, which is an organization based out of Chicago, and they will be talking about Palestine, its history, and its prospects for peace in the future. So to get started, uh, I would like to introduce Imam Mazhar. Um, Imam Mazhar is Imam, or a spiritual leader of a local mosque here in Peoria. And to begin, he will be reading um, from the first chapter of the Quran, which is our holy text, from a surah called Surah Al-Fatiha, and he'll be reading it in Arabic and English and explaining the meaning. And then we'll go on to a second surah called Surah Al-Isra, and we'll be reading the first seven verses of that as well. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, all praise is due to Allah, Lord of the world, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful, sovereign of the day of recompense. It is you we worship and you we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those upon whom you have bestowed your favor, not of those who, who have evoked your anger or of those who are astray. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, glory be to the one, the Almighty, the one who facilitated the night journey for his servant. In the nighttime, from the sacred mosque of Mecca, the sacred Masjid al-Haram, located in Mecca, to al-Masjid al-Aqsa, the Aqsa Mosque, located in Palestine, الذي باركنا حوله whose surroundings we have blessed to show him the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him our signs indeed he is the hearing and the seeing and we gave Moses Musa السلام, <coughs> peace and blessings upon him the scripture and made it a guidance for the children of Israel, the Banu Israel, called the children of Israel, which is the name Israel, that be, being the name of Yaqub Jacob, that was his other name. So this is what they became known as. Giving them the command that you not take other than me as a disposer of affairs. O descendants of those we carried in the ship with Noah, indeed he was a grateful servant. We ask the Almighty to facilitate goodness for us. 
we ask the Almighty to make this uh, event a means of leading us from strength to strength and from education to enlight enlightenment. And we ask the Almighty to grant all of us goodness in both the worlds. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be to all of you. I welcome all of you and uh, sorry for the delay. We are driving right from Chicago. It took some extra time. Uh, Brother Mahmood, I'm sure, just recited the Quran. He's the Imam or MSA president. Brother That's okay. Thank you very much. I really wanted to thank all the volunteers from Islam Foundation and the other mosques who met several past several weeks to plan this event as well as the MSA members. <clears throat> I'm going to ask Brother Dale uh, Prusensky, he's the Managing Director of Washington Report on Middle East Affairs. He's been there for 10 years. His specialty is on lobbies, different lobbies, how they work in America, how the scenes are made, how the, the scenes are influenced by lobbies. He's going to give us his insight based on the facts and figures, just purely facts and figures, and an objective analysis, not taking any sides, of what's going on there. So, brother, uh, I call it brother Dave, please. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I woke up in DC today to very snowy weather and lots of canceled flights. I didn't think I was going to make it but at last I am here. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna just talk a little bit today about how lobbies work, specifically the uh, pro-Israel lobby. Uh, I can also ask to talk a little bit about Christian Zionism and just sort of some myths and stuff like that about Israel, Palestine, and, and all of that. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna dig right into it. Uh, so yeah, so obviously, Lobbying, uh, for better or for worse, is just kind of central to how politics works, right, in D.C. If you, any given day, walk down the street on Capitol Hill when Congress is in session, you will see the place teeming with lobbyists for any and every cause, popping out of Ubers with their binders full of information to deliver to members of Congress. Um, so it's just a reality. It's, it's how it works. Uh, so obviously, what we're concerned about here today is foreign lobbies, right? And by foreign lobbies, I don't mean lobbies from other countries, but lobbies of Americans lobbying on behalf of foreign countries. And Israel has the most powerful foreign lobby in the United States, right? So the other powerful ones would be the Cuban lobby, or Irish, Armenian also are a notable. But Israel, in terms of power, in terms of influence, in terms of monetary donations to candidates, has the most powerful foreign lobby in the country. And you know, and just to be clear from the outset, right? There's nothing conspiratorial about this, right? This is our system. It's legal. They're allowed to do it. So it's not some nefarious, you know, conspiracy theory. And even critics of the lobby, right? John Mearsheimer, Stephen Waltz, who wrote a famous book on the Israel lobby. No, it's, it's, it's part of the system, and that's just how our system works. So yeah, so lobbying members of Congress, it starts early. It starts way before they get to Washington in most cases. Um, it starts when they're at the city level. You know, they're on city council or something like that. Pro-Israel groups will generally, you know, get cozy with them, lobby them there. Uh, local chapters of, for instance, the Anti-Defamation League or local uh, community Jewish foundations will tend to, or other Zionist groups, you know, will tend to get involved with them there and kind of take them on trips to Israel, perhaps, you know, paid prepaid trips to, to kind of butter them up, <laughs> you know, to give them a, night, a good uh, impression of Israel and fund their campaigns early on. And it kind of helps, right, because by the time they get to Washington, this is kind of their default disposition. And you have to remember, a lot of members of Congress don't necessarily care about this topic, right? Unless they come from very select districts where there are a lot of people of either, you know, who care about this topic, most people don't. They go into Congress running on 
healthcare or immigration, whatever. So they don't want to be bothered by this. They don't want foreign policy matters to crush their campaign. So they view this as the path of least resistance. They understand if they don't anger these groups, they're not going to face challenges, right? They're not going to have massive amounts of money poured into them you know, in campaigns to try and take them out of office. So this is kind of the default, right? So it's, it's carrots and sticks, right? They get lots of incentives to do it, but if they cross a boundary, they tend to get smacked down pretty hard. And this can happen even amongst people who are pro-Israel. So you'll see um, you know, multiple cases of a congressman who's would say, I'm a Zionist, I support Israel. But he'll be challenged by someone who's more Zionist, who's more pro-Israel. So even within you know, that camp, there's these debates. And there's this pressure that you can never be you know, pro-Israel enough. Yeah, and so, like, and so this is like the fulcrum of what the lobby does, right? They focus most of their attention on members of Congress. Their secondary uh, kind of focus will be on the public discourse. And they'll mostly focus that attention, as we've seen in the news lately, uh, college campuses, right? Because that's kind of the place where ideas are formed, new ideas can take off. Obviously, in this country, it's a, you know, look at the Vietnam War in opposition to that, and lots of other changes have lots of their roots in college campuses. And so that's why you'll see things like lots of activity uh, to shut down, you know, discourse that they find damaging. And that's why we see lots of states adopting laws um, to define criticizing Israel's anti-Semitic, you know, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition is now in place in more than 30 states. Uh, Anti-BDS laws are also in place in more than 30 states, which in some way, shape, or form limit the ability of Americans to participate in boycotts of Israel without the sign contracts, basically saying, before I speak at a public university, or even take any kind of job, work with prisoners, you know, give mental health care, I have to sign a form saying that I don't engage in boycotts of Israel. There are challenges of these happening in the court systems. The court system, most have been challenged favorably, some have not. Um, and of course, it goes without saying, boycotts again play an important role in our in national history. If you look back to anti-racism uh, campaigns with Jim Crow laws, right? Boycotts were foundational to that. And as far as most legal scholars are concerned, there's really no basis uh, for these laws uh, to exist, but they do. And again, those laws come by you know, immense pressure, immense lobbying members of Congress to pass them. What's also interesting is the lobbying isn't just focused though on members of Congress. There's also lots of pressure on staff members. And you know, something that people don't necessarily realize is your congressional office, especially on the House side, is staffed mostly by people in their 20s, right? These are people fresh out of college, these are people not getting paid a lot, and these are people with career ambitions. So basically, who are they, right, generally speaking, to challenge the lobby, right? DC is, perhaps more than other cities, a very careerist city. People have, you know, 10, 20, 30 year plans of where they want to be, they're in Congress, as staffers because they want to get jobs eventually in the private sector, in most cases, they want to network. Um, so yeah, they're also allowed. They'll be taking on trips to Israel as well. You know, I have a friend who went on one and she got a pro-Israel tattoo on her, <laughs> on her arm after going to one. Uh, so these things, you know, these things do work. And, and again, it's the path of least resistance, right? Why am I going to destroy my career if I took this job, you know, not caring about Poor policy, not caring about the Middle East. And, and so in all of this, there's also a, a kind of a big debate, right, amongst people who study this, right? Why is US policy towards Israel so skewed to favoring Israel, right? You have the people who really emphasize the lobby, right, who say this is a matter of money, that's why it's this way. You have other people who tend to, people like Noam Chomsky, who will tend to focus more on culture, you know, they'll say, well, Israel and the U.S. have kind of a shared settler colonial narrative, it's about imperialism and all of that. And, and it's a real debate. 
I myself tend to, I think there's not, there are merits to both arguments. But ultimately, I think you have to side on the power of the lobby to explain it, just because there's just really no other explanation as to why members of Congress will focus so much on this topic. If you look through congressional bills, resolutions, no other country has more bills, resolutions introduced about it than Israel. More than on the UK or Mexico or Canada, right? And this is a small country on the other side of the world. And yes, there are influences, right? People care about Israel for religious reasons that aren't related to politics. For cultural reasons, it's the holy land it draws fascination. So I think it plays off of both ends of it, right? People can form pro-Israel sympathies for cultural and religious reasons, but the lobby really comes in to solidify it and take it to the next level. And then there's also the issue, right, of, well, how does this reflect what Americans think? Are, are these policies reflective of what Americans think? There are polls that show Americans, and again, how much do you want to believe polls? That's up to you. But there are, there are polls that show Americans tend to favor Israel more than Palestine. And again, it's a question of what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? If you're fed a lot of pro-Israel narratives, people are tend to be more likely to support Israel. But the polls also show that a significant amount of people in this country are critical of Israeli policy, especially on the left. And so, yeah. So there's this question of, first of all, right, it's a foreign policy matter. Think of how little we talk about foreign policy in our country. We were at war in Iraq for 20 years, in Afghanistan for 20 years. At a certain point, it became normalized, right? Americans, I would argue for the worst, tend to not focus a lot on foreign policy. But for some reason, and we've seen this with the Gaza conflict, right? At some point, for some reason, this is almost a domestic issue. Like, Joe Biden is at risk of losing an election next year because a bunch of Arab and Muslim and other Americans are so upset with his Gaza policy, right? In a way that you almost don't even see with uh, you know, American wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. So yeah, I think it's not so much that uh, Congress is addressing this, it's just how much they're addressing, like I said, more than any other foreign policy matter and the extreme lengths they go to show bias is where they are not being the American people where they're at. Right, and so in terms of just some money here, right? So in the last election cycle, the 2020 election cycle, pro-Israel groups gave $58 billion to members of Congress. $58 billion, right? Only 33 members of Congress did not receive these funds. And of that $58 billion, 42% of it was given to just six Democrats running against progressives. And all six of those people challenging progressives won their race, including Andy Levin, who again, as I mentioned before, a liberal Zionist who was deemed not pro-Israel enough and was defeated by a pro-Israel candidate. And, and in terms of that too, we have an early quote here from Harry Truman, right, back when he was deciding is the U.S. going to recognize Israel? He says this, I have to answer to hundreds of thousands who are anxious for the success of Zionism, but I do not have hundreds of thousands of Arabs among my constituents. Now obviously things have changed since back then, and the Arab population has grown in the U.S. since then, but it's sort of the two sides of it, right? It's, it's the cynical politics, and it's also the power of money. And, you know, there's also the question of, are members of Congress ignorant on this, or are they not? I've had members of Congress say, you know, well, I have pro-Israel groups come into my office all the time. I never have pro-Palestinian groups come into my office. I'm just not familiar, you know, with what their demands are, with what they're concerned about. What's an open debate? All right. So now I'm going to transition a little bit into some of, I guess, the myths about Israel. That, that phrasing is a little... I don't want to sound conspiratorial, but just, you know, misconceptions, we'll say, right? And I think the big one to start with here is just in terms of the foreign aid, right? We donate, donate we give from our taxpayers $3.8 billion a year to Israel, right? And it's the idea that 
they need the money. And by the way, you could argue it's more because we give up 1.2 to 1.4 billion to Egypt, which kind of exists because of the Camp David Accords. We give money to Jordan in the tune of billions a year, again, kind of because they made peace with Israel. And there's also secret military budgets and stuff like that that goes to them. Of course, we have more than, what is it, 13, 14 billion slated to be passed, also in emergency money for Israel in the current Congress. But anyway, right, they, they need this money, right? And the facts show Israel has one of the largest per capita GDPs in the world, right? It's recognized among the world's largest economies. So the question raised, again, you can have all the moral arguments you want about why we should support Israel or why we should not. But the fact that Israel gets more money than any other country in the world from the US, historically, besides the modern Ukraine situation, it's kind of baffling, right? Like, why does this country need the money? They really don't, right? You think they have universal health care, <laughs> you know? And someone like Cory Bush would say, like, imagine my, you know, my district, my poor district, you know, on the outskirts of St. Louis had just a portion of $3.8 billion a year given to its residents, right? Imagine if $3.8 billion could be given to people with student loan debt, you know, stuff like that. Or even to more charitable foreign aid causes, right? Imagine if we could use that money to build, you know, hospitals or something, you know, or help rebuild the Yemen or Syria, or, you know, go down the list, you know? So that's a very, I think, powerful cause uh, to question the idea of why we give them money. Um, and not to mention most of the money is military money, right? And Israel itself has a giant weapons industry. It's the 10th largest arms dealer in the world. So the idea that they need access to weapons is also pretty questionable. Uh, and as a side note, and you can give a whole talk on this, but a lot of these weapons that Israel manufactures do end up in pretty dubious hands. You know, as one example, they've given money to the military government in Myanmar, which has used those weapons. Uh, as part of their genocide against the Rohingya. So, you know, and that's a whole other topic. There's also the idea of, you know, of course, Israel likes to boast only democracy in the Middle East. And we're going to put aside all the questions of how that works vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem and all, you know, the inequalities there. But even within Israel's declared borders, you see lots of inequality there, right? So the Masawa Center, which is an Arab uh, human rights organization in, uh, based in Israel, right, has cited more than 50 laws that openly discriminate against Palestinian citizens of Israel. Uh, since October 7th, we've seen a lot of incidents of, especially on college campuses, of people voicing critical views of Israel, uh, facing sanctions either from the university, from their institution, or even legally. Um, yes. Yeah, some people argue who are pro-Israel that, uh, you know, well, you have, you know, you have Palestinians, or they'll probably call them Arabs, on the uh, Supreme Court or on, you know, in the Knesset. And that's true, although those are more likely to face sanction and if they criticize Israeli policy. You know, I feel like a couple times a year, you're likely to come across an article of a Palestinian member of the Knesset facing some sort of heavy sanction. Uh, for stating their opinion. And then, of course, you have the nation-state law, which was passed several years ago, which defined Israel as a, the nation-state of the Jewish people exclusively, right? Preferential treatment to the Jewish people, which kind of let the cat, and the audience of mine, let the cat out of the bag to kind of, you know, they're not, they really were hiding anymore. And they got a lot of criticism even from people who are generally be supportive of Israel, right? So you think of the Druze population, D-R-U-Z-E, in Israel, which tend to, as a whole to be pretty loyal to the government, actually. And a lot of them were kind of like, you know, what is this about? We've been loyal citizens of this state, and now you're kind of kicking us to the curb. We serve in the IDF. We do a whole bunch of stuff for this country. Another uh, kind of thing I'd like to talk about here is, and I think this is an important one to bring up, too, and you saw it a lot with the most recent Israeli government, right? People saying, well, you know, the problem is that this is a right-wing government, right? They kind of loop it in and say, like, this is, and you see this a lot amongst Democrats who have traditionally been supportive of Israel, but now feel the need to criticize them a little bit. But there's a lot of evidence that the current government, while indeed being probably the most right-wing in Israeli history, and indeed doing more to, especially in the West Bank and now Gaza, uh, to infringe on the, the rights of Palestinians. That being said, they're kind of just embracing 
long-held policies to just executing them kind of on a grand scale, right? It's kind of just Israeli policy on steroids. And I have a quote here from uh, Israeli journalist Gideon Levy, right? And he, he wants everyone to know that the problem, the settlement, right? He says the settlement started with the Zionist left, right? He says the Zionist left is the real enemy of freedom, of fighting the occupation of Israel much more than the right wing. First of all, they are the founding fathers of the settlements. It wasn't started by Netanyahu, not by Ariel Sharon. No, it was Yitzhak Rabin, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, a peacemaker. He, they are responsible, right? So we have to be cognizant of that, especially I think in the internal discourse of our country, how we talk about these things. And it's funny too, because you'll see our politicians, again, especially looking at more people from the left, They'll criticize Netanyahu but, and his government, but they'll still meet with them. They'll still discuss, you know, negotiate with them. And you imagine, would they have done that? Would they go hold hands with, you know, Victor Orban or back when power, Bolsonaro or Putin, you know, and just kind of look past it? it it's, not, it's not really so. The other topic here is uh, the idea that U.S. Israel is a, an important strategic ally of the United States. Right, and you'll hear that a lot. You'll hear, of course, you know, it's the greatest ally, or they do a lot to help us. And again, I have a quote here from Lawrence Wilkerson, who was Secretary of State Colin Powell's Chief of Staff, who says that Israel has been a foreign and national security policy problem for decades. Uh, former Secretary of State George Marshall, who is you know, a very popular man in our nation's history, he strongly objected to the U.S. strongly supporting Israel back uh, when Truman supported it. He advised him against it. Back then, the Joint Chiefs of Staff said this to President Truman, that supporting Israel would prejudice United States strategic interests in the Near and Middle East to the point that the United States' influence in the region would be curtailed to that which could be maintained by military force. I think that has proven to be true. Uh, Wilkerson quotes his uh, former boss, Colin Powell, as saying that this. He says that when they used to talk about national security issues, they rarely, if ever, complimented Israel on its additions to U.S. security posture in the region. Quite the opposite, as a matter of fact. So, and if you you go and just type it into Google, right, you'll see an abundance of evidence from people who have worked in the government making this case. And we kind of, right, we see it now to apply it just as one case study to the ongoing Gaza war, right? I mean, because we have stood by Israel in such a staunch way during this war, we're now in a firing match with the Houthis. Our bases are under attack in Syria and Iraq. Our pivot to Asia is once again stalled. Shipping is, you know, is a is you know backlog now, and we're at increased risk, right? A blowback, right? I mean, we're we're making people very angry in the region, and not to legitimize it for at all, you know, but we raise the risk of people acting out violently against. Americans on our own soil or abroad because of these decisions. And then I finally, um, and again, this one's a little touchy, but right, the idea that, yeah, the idea that Israel is just, right, it, it's kind of, it's always responding to being attacked, right? And this is a narrative you see pushed a lot. And, and it's, it, to be clear, right, I mean, you do have Hezbollah on its northern border, you do have Hamas firing missiles, you do have the Houthis firing stuff, you know, from the south. So it's not to say that there is no one surrounding Israel who is willing, you know, to use violence against them. Of course, there's a whole bunch of context behind all that as to why Hezbollah even exists, as to why Hamas even exists, and a lot of it goes back to Israeli actions decades ago. Right? But it, what we often miss in this country, right, is is the context, right? And we see instances of nonviolent resistance in Palestine being met with excessive violence frequently. Uh, just think back, what was it to you, right? Shireen Abu Akhla, not doing anything violent, right? Assassinated by Israel in, uh, in Jenin, and yeah, and covered up, right? It, it's, it's been two years now, just changing stories, right? A couple years ago, there was a famous documentary, right, called Five Broken Cameras, basically filming nonviolent resistance in the West Bank, and it's called Five Broken Cameras because they kept on getting attacked for their nonviolent resistance. 
you think of a, a project in the West Bank outside of Bethlehem called Tenth of Nations, right? It's meant to be a peace project, and the settlers keep on breaking into it and with the help of the Israeli government and destroying the property. So then, you know, it kind of raises the question, and I'm not here for a second to endorse violence. That's, you know, but, you know, it's the kind of the idea where you put, it's indisputable, right? People in Gaza live in a besieged territory. People in the West Bank live under occupation. They resist nonviolently, they're met with violence. It takes an extraordinary level of human discipline to not respond with violence. And, right, and what happens? Those little acts of nonviolence generally don't get into the mainstream news. We're talking about Gaza now because Hamas launched an attack of a, on a grand scale, right? And again, that's not to endorse anything that happened on October 7th, only to say, we're talking about it because of that. The United States government is now considering the two-state solution, again, whatever you think of that, is <laughs> talking about a definitive peace proposal, again, for the first time in decades, not decades, but years, because of that. So it's, it's just, it's simply to say, you know, when you put oppressed people in a lose-lose situation, the idea that you can just kind of cry victim easily is, I think, dubious. And, and you see this, and it's tied back to his policy, right? A couple years ago, must have been five, six, seven years ago now, I was on Capitol Hill for the launch of something called the Israel Victory Project. It was, it's an initiative of Daniel Pipes, who is, uh, has a long history of kind of inciting anti-Muslim sentiment and being very uh, pro-Israel from the Middle East Forum, is the organization he works for and leads. And basically the idea of the Israel Victory Project was, is this, to, it argues that Palestinians need to have it instilled in them that they've lost. That basically, we can't go forward, right, as peace is impossible until the loser accepts they've lost. And there's a caucus called the Israel Victory Caucus on Capitol Hill, you know, committed to this. And while he was in Congress, Ron DeSantis was a part of this, he was at that launch on Capitol Hill. So it, it's, it's hard to say that it's not impacting US policy, this kind of thinking, at least certain members of, of, of the government. So yeah, so that's just kind of, you know, some matters of perspective there. So I'll talk, talk a little bit about the media now, since I work for a magazine. <laughs> and just to be clear of who I am, right? So I work for a magazine called The Washington Report on Middle East Affairs. It was founded in 1982 by two former US Foreign Service officers who had served in the Middle East their entire career. And basically this was their retirement project. They kind of were very disgruntled with what they saw in their region, of what they saw on the ground of the consequences of US foreign policy. And this was their way back in the day, before Twitter, before all these kind of other sources existed to easily spread information. They started this magazine to kind of change the narrative, to educate Americans about what's happening in the region. But anyway, so media, right? Media faces a lot of challenges also in terms of reporting on this topic. Um, two good books, on, a good book on it is called Dateline Jerusalem by John Lyons. He was a, a correspondent uh, in Jerusalem for a while. He's Australian. And he basically just talks about the constant pressure he would face, right? He, if he would write something critical about Israel, pro-Israel groups, and in, in his case in Australia, but the same thing happens here, would contact his editors, would make a whole scene of it on the ground, you know, again, the whole range of, of, of things. He would, they would offer propaganda trips, they would offer fluff pieces, which is actually very common, right, you know, come to this, you know, farm and see this amazing thing that's happening, you know, like, and so there's, again, the carrot and the stick playing out there. And it, and it comes down to the same idea as when it's in Congress, right? They want to instill in people the notion it's just not worth it, right? It's not worth it to cover this topic in a critical way. And it works in, in many cases, right? Because you have to remember, media outlets, right? Politicians really want, they want to get elected. What do the media outlets want? 
to, they want to stay in business, they want to make money. And if you're constantly being hounded by people, it, it hurts the bottom line. And the other note I just want to make on the media as well is how pro regional groups kind of creep in very easily into mainstream media narratives. So you, if you read any mainstream newspaper, you're very likely to see, for instance, quotes from representatives of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, right? Which sounds like a great title, right? <laughs> Who doesn't want to defend democracy? Except, right, the group is heavily funded by pro-Israel interests. An undercover documentary called The Lobby USA basically undercovered a lot of this, found them working with, they worked directly with the Israeli Ministry of, uh, it's not foreign affairs, but strategic affairs, to plant, you know, to, first of all, to spy on, on certain students and stuff like that, but in terms of the media, you know, to get this narrative out there, right? And they're very hawkish, especially on the Iran front, right? They're the leading voice that were, was against, you know, the Iran nuclear deal, and there's a whole history there of why Iran is presented as the boogeyman, but I'm not gonna necessarily get into that. Finally, I was asked to talk a little bit about Christian Zionism. And this is, you know, so you have the two fronts, right, in this country, basically. You have Jewish Zionism and you have Christian Zionism that are kind of the two faces of support for Israel in this country. But they actually work in very different ways, right? So the the Jewish Zionist organizations tend to be the financial center of the Israel army, right? So they fund a lot of, they fund candidates, they fund uh, PACs and stuff like that. The Christian Zionists are seen more as like the boots on the ground, right? They're the people who are going to show up in mass to the congressional office. They're the people who are going to, you know, vote in the caucuses, you know, in Iowa and in and places like that. Yeah. So, like, and then within Christian Zionism, right, there's also different degrees, right? You have, I would call more of a, a passive kind of Christian Zionism, right, where it's, it's more, you know, they'll take lines like from Genesis, right? I will bless those who bless Israel, right? Which, by the way, if you read Genesis, that the context there is not relevant to the modern state of Israel, right? But it, it's this version of Christian Zionism, I would call, you know, it's less severe, right, in terms of its degree. It's more just, these are God's chosen people, God likes them, who am I to say, you know, like, to question what they do. That's, you know, that's between them and God. Then you kind of have the more extreme Christian Zionists, right? The ones who basically are, are in this to bring about the end times, <laughs> right? They, see, they look at Israel and they say, they'll look at scripture, however they look at it, and find a, a narrative that says, we need confrontation in the Holy Land to bring about the second coming. And then this is the kind of support for Israel that gets very controversial, right? Because these are the groups that are more likely to even express anti-Semitic language, right? And so this group is very, it's a very nihilistic kind of alliance they have with the state of Israel because they'll be welcome to Israel. They'll shake hands with you know, the prime minister and all sorts of people and their, their kind of anti-Semitism will be tolerated because they know they do so much to influence policy in the U.S. And you just look in November, right? There was a, a big rally for Israel in the National Mall, and one of the invited speakers was John Hayden, right? And then, again, and in a climate where everyone is screaming about the horrors of anti-Semitism, right? And there's a lot of anti-Semitism out there that needs to be critiqued in absolute terms, right? But then to invite a man who's on the record, again, it's just Google it, saying all sorts of horrible things about Jewish people, to this rally because he's pro-Israel, right? It's, it's very, very cynical. And then you also just kind of have even more passive forms of Christian Zionism, right? The people may not even call themselves Christian Zionists, but they just, you know, it's the Bible. They read about the Holy Land of the Bible. They're kind of just fascinated about it. And so they're kind of just, you know, they're kind of inclined to like it. Oh, about time. I'm just going to finish with three, one point here, and that is this. The law is governing aid, right, foreign aid. 
we have lots of laws on the books as a country about the parameters with which aid should be given. There's the Foreign Assistance Act and the Leahy Laws. Both laws basically say that no military assistance can be given to military groups that violate human rights. You have the Symington and Glenn Amendments that state that no countries that possess nuclear weapons outside of international safeguards basically by being members of the non-proliferation agreement, if they're not in alignment with that, they cannot get U.S. foreign aid. Israel is not a member of the NPT. So you know, a lot of people would rightly say, by the way, the State Department's own human rights reports cite human rights violations by Israeli <laughs> military groups. Everyone knows that Israel has nuclear weapons, although there is an ongoing agreement that no U.S. politician or president admits it. Right? So you used to have a famous journalist, Helen Thomas, who would ask every president, and like, you know, his first in office, excuse me, president, does Israel have nuclear weapons? And they would just not answer the question because they know the Simington and Glenn Amendment says they can't, if they say yes, U.S. aid is invalid. Um, so yeah, those are just things to keep in mind. Um, I'll wrap it up here. I have some other stuff I could say, but you know, feel free to ask me questions. Uh, and I do have some list of things that people can do to effectively, you know, have their voices heard in this country. If you want to get to that later. Thank you. Thank you. You know, at times, conflicts like the one we are seeing now, uh, and I've grown old seeing these conflicts, they disheartened. You feel, is, it, is there any end to this, these conflicts? Well, there may not be an end, but if we come together like we did today, and we exert our pressure, we can at least contain them. If we can't fix them, we can contain them. So, um, so events and coming together the way we did today present a hope. And we have to keep that hope alive. Um, Dr. Sabeel Ahmed, I'm going to ask him to speak next for about 25 minutes, 20 minutes. He's going to talk about he's going to talk about Islam in 10 minutes or so. Just give you a brief introduction, and he's going to talk about some highlights in the history when Jews and Muslims collaborated positive. He's um, executive director of Gain Peace. It's an organization based out of Chicago. It works to remove misconceptions about Islam as a faith and bringing people together of different faiths. Our differences are there, but we have a whole lot more in, more in common, so we can make this society a much better place to live. Dr. Sabina, are you going to say that? I start in the name of God, the most beneficent and the most merciful, and greet all of you with the Islamic greeting of Assalamu Alaikum. In Arabic, that means peace of God be upon each single one of you. So I was, uh, as I was coming in, there were some guests who were walking inside the room, and the back uh, of one of the shirts of one of the girls who was walking in, it says that the fight for Palestinian rights is the fight for the human rights. And I was so amazed. And I said, I fully agree with that. Do any one of you agree with that statement? Yes? Very good. Almost all of you. So first and foremost, on behalf of the admins, I want to welcome all of you, and especially with our brother Dale, with a big round of applause for him. Calgary this past weekend, uh, it was minus 31 degrees, all right? When I came back to Chicago, it was minus 2 degrees and felt like a heat wave. Right? <laughs> it did, by the way. What was your temperature at your place, Gina? Oh, it was in the 20s. I'm from Florida, so I think it was 60s. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's summer for us in Chicago, right? So when I was at the airport coming back to Chicago, one of the brothers up there in, uh, in, from Calgary, he contacted me, right? He telephoned me and he said, you know, Dr. Sabir, I have a lecture coming up this coming weekend. Can you give me three points how we can achieve peace anywhere in the world, not limited to Palestine? Three points, right? And I mentioned to him the very first point, as you can see up here. The very first point is that every single human 
should see other humans as equal. That is the foundation, I would say. If we don't see each other as equal, that means obviously if a person thinks, you know, my race, my culture, my nationality is superior, that means obviously they are going to oppress, there would be oppression, there would be injustice. So to align with that, the passage of the Quran, chapter 49, verse number 13 says, so by the way, if any one of you would like to get a free copy of the Quran, they are out there free in the lobby, right? Uh, but the Khadir has some limited copies, so first come, first serve. So that passage says, this is the translation, that, uh, oh humanity, so God is speaking to humanity and God is saying, that oh mankind, oh humanity, I have created you from one single male and one single female, and made you into nations and peoples and tribes, that you get to know each other. Not that you may hate and despise and discriminate. God is saying that He made us different so we can get to know each other. That God is saying that the best amongst you is the one who is a well-mannered, God-fearing person. So I would say that the foundation of establishing peace is to see each other as equals. The second point I mentioned to the brother from, uh, from, uh, uh, from Canada, Calgary, is that the second point is that there should be justice to be done to each other. You know, uh, some of you may have seen this. If you go to the Harvard University, uh, in, the, in the faculty of law, at the entrance there is a passage from the Quran. And this is in chapter 4 of the Quran, verse number 135, and the passage reads like this. This is again the translation. So according to Harvard, this is one of the decisive passages to bring justice and peace and harmony to the world. And they took out one passage from the Quran. Uh, so the translation is this. That all you who believe, stand firmly for justice. As whereas uh, uh, to, uh, whereas to yourself, or to your parents, or to your kin, and whether it be against rich or poor, for Allah can best protect all of you. So this is a really important passage that if you want to establish peace, uh, peace is the outcome when justice is established. So that's really important, right? I mean, for each one of these principles and concepts, we can have many, many uh, you know, narrations from the Quran, from the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and many, many Muslims. And last but not the least, to establish peace and justice in the world, there has to be accountability. Accountability means we have to acknowledge that there is a higher power. You know, we are in Bradley University over here. At the end of the semester, there is always going to be, uh, there is going to be evaluation by the professor. Based upon the attendance policy, based upon the quizzes, the exams, and the participation, right? A whole list of conditions, there would be a, there would be an evaluation. If there is no evaluation, you know, why would a student come to the class and take the exams and do the assignments? So accountability is really important for humans to be disciplined, to establish equality, and yes, to establish uh, justice in the world. So regarding the accountability, Islam says that there is a creator, and this creator is one with wonderful attributes. In Arabic, we say he's Allah. And we say that he has sent prophets and messengers, like Prophet Abraham and Moses and Jesus and Abraham and Isaac and Solomon and David, many, many prophets all throughout history. Number three, God also sent us study guides, right, as we say, because this is a campus. He sent uh, books and scriptures and study guides, so humanity can live in peace and justice. And lastly, one day we all have to die, and standing in front of God, and God would be judging us based upon how we live this life. So justice and equality and accountability, they're all connected. And if we take these principles to heart, that is the way to do justice and the outcome would be peace. As Brother Irfan has mentioned, I did some research into how did Muslims manifested these principles in history, especially in the context of the Jewish people. So Muslims in the context of the Jewish people. So some of you who may be historians, you may know that the Romans, they ransacked Jerusalem and they destroyed the Jewish temple in 70 AD or 70 CE. When that happened, the Jews were expelled from Palestine. They cannot live up there. They cannot go and worship to the places of worship. So they were expelled for 600 years, right? 600 years, by the way. Not by the Muslims, but by the Romans and by the Christians. So when that happened, 
Some of them, they went to different parts of the world and some they moved to Medina. So those Jewish people who moved to Medina, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he traveled from Mecca to Medina, he found many, many Jewish tribes. One of the very first thing he did was, he formed a constitution called the Charter of Medina. And the Charter of Medina says that the Muslims and the Jewish people, we would be one people. Look at this. We would be one people. Muslims are going to protect the Jewish people and give them freedom, give them rights, and give them autonomy. So when the Jewish people, when they were preyed upon by the, by the Romans and the Persians and the Egyptians, it were the commandments of the Quran manifested by Muhammad, peace be upon him, that protected the Jewish people from extinction. That's an important point, by the way, right? So that's example number one. Example number two is, in the year 637, when, when Caliph Umar, the second Khalifa, when he went to Jerusalem in the year 637, there were hardly any Jewish people up there before because they were, uh, they were persecuted and they were expelled by the Romans. So Khalifa Umar, he said, I'm not going to pray in the Christian church because if I pray, I don't want to set it as a precedence for Muslims to capture that church. So he prayed the five daily prayers outside of the church. That is justice, by the way. That is justice. So he, he wrote one more constitution called as the Pact of Umar. And the Pact of Umar says that every Jewish person who was expelled for the last 600 years, you can, you can come back again from Europe, from Africa, from Russia, from different parts of the world. And he made the Jewish community thrive under him in Palestine. That is reality, that's the fact, and that is Islamic justice. In the 7th century again, right? Uh, so from the 8th to the 11th century, many Jewish people who were driven out by the rest of the Europeans, people, uh, by the rest of the Europeans, every single time when the Jewish people, when they, when they were persecuted and they, when they were expelled, always they came to the Muslim countries for help. And Muslims, we help them because it is a form of for taking care of the oppressed people, and it, that's one of the principles of Islam. So not only the Jewish people they came to the Muslim Spain, according to the virtual Jewish library, and you can uh, you can go online and search for it. According to the virtual Jewish library, the golden age of Judaism was under the Muslim Spain. You know this is history. These are the facts. So when people, when they look at the situation up there, and they say, you know what, the Muslims hate the Jewish people, it's an eternal war, that's not the case. Anytime, anywhere, when Jews were persecuted, it doesn't have to be Jews, by the way. It could be the Hindus, the Christians, the Buddhists, or atheists, anyone who's persecuted, Muslims were the very first people, and history testifies to that. Massacre of the Jewish people, right? In 1099, when the Franks, when the Crusaders, when they came and they ransacked Jerusalem, they ransacked, they, they, they ransacked the whole Palestine. The Muslims, they were hiding in Majid, Majid al-Aqsa, 30,000 of them. They were hiding in Majid al-Aqsa, the third holiest uh, mosque for Muslims. Every single one of them, they were murdered by the Franks. To such an extent that the Franks used to go inside Majid al-Aqsa, kill a few of the Muslims, get tired, and they used to go home and come back the next day and the next day to such an extent that uh, the blood of the Muslims were flowing up to the ankles and to the knees. Same thing happened to the innocent Jewish people by the hands of the Crusaders. Then, alhamdulillah, right? When Allah, when He sent Salahuddin Ayyub in the year 1187, again, one of the constitutions, one of the facts that he made is that every single Jewish people who are persecuted and oppressed, now you can live in freedom. Now you can live in autonomy. Now you have all the rights. The rights were taken away by the other people. See, this is history, by the way. These are the facts and these are the principles coming from the Quran and the authentic Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You know, in France, from the year 1182, for literally many, many centuries, the Christian for France, the Jewish people, they were expelled many, many times. You know, they were expelled and sometimes some other ruler used to bring them back and expelled and brought them back. Every time they were expelled, they went to the Muslim Spain. 
They went to Morocco, they went to Tunisia, they went to Egypt, and yes, they also went to Palestine, and Muslims open our hearts and doors up there. This is again Islamic principles, by the way, right? And these are my resources. You know, some of you may be thinking, Sabir, where did you get your info from? These are the Christian, the Jewish, and the secular resources, and who all, you know, authenticate what is being said. Some of you again would be surprised that from the year 1290, the Jewish people from England, they were expelled literally for three, four, five centuries. Right away when they were expelled, they all, they all migrated to the Muslim Spain. And the Muslims again, they opened the hearts and the minds, and they welcomed the Jewish people, right? Again, that's history. Not only the Jewish people, they were, they were embraced by the Muslims, they were given higher positions. So let me ask you this quiz question, right? Very quickly, then I'm going to wrap up, inshallah, God willing. Okay, can you name uh, me, any one of you, right, without googling this, who was the greatest scholar of the Jewish faith, and the hint is this, he was born in the, he was born in Muslim Spain, he moved to Morocco, and then he moved to Egypt, and then he wrote the Jewish Mishnah. Bible yes, <laughs> Moses Maimonides, right, bam bam as we say. So he's the product of the Muslim Spain, you know, his parents, they moved to Spain, away from the persecution from the Europeans. So he moved to Spain with his parents, and then he moved from there, and he went to a university in Morocco. So here is the quiz question again. That university that he went to, and he graduated, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, it is the oldest continuous university in the whole world, right? Older than Bradley, by the way. <laughs> Older, oldest university in the world, and one more hint is that it was established by a Muslim lady wearing the hijab. Raise of hands. Which campus do you think that? Yes. Azhar. Al-Azhar is in Egypt. <laughs> Al-Azhar is the second one, by the way, right? You are close enough. Yes. Yeah. All right. Again, who else? Yeah. Aryaman. Yeah, Aryaman. It is in Fez, Morocco, established in 859 by a Muslim lady called uh, Fatima al Ferry. So Moses Maimonides, he came up there and he was an alumni up there, right? A Muslim university. And he graduated and then he went to Egypt and he was made, made a wazir by Sultan. That is Islamic history. That is the Muslim diversity that, that it embraced. All right, in 13th century to 17th century, when the Muslims uh, and the Jewish people, when the Spanish Inquisition happened, in Spain obviously, right, Spanish Inquisition, the Muslims and the Jewish people, they were only given three choices. Either you convert to Christianity, or we will burn you at stake, or you'll be kicked out. Three choices, right? Only three choices. Many of them, unfortunately, they, they converted out of fear. Some of them, they were both to stay. But the majority of the Jewish people, where did they go after the Crusaders? Or after the Spanish Inquisition? They went to Ottoman Empire. They went to, uh, they went to Egypt, Tunisia, right, Morocco. And yes, they also went to Palestine. So when you see, you know, where did these uh, Jewish people started to live in Palestine? Because every single time they were persecuted somewhere in the world and Muslims, we opened the door. So the current Jewish people, many of them, they were descendants who were persecuted and Muslims welcomed them in Palestine. Alright, so that's again, from Portugal, from Hungary, from Italy, I can have slide after slide after slide. Every time Jewish people persecuted, Muslims, they come, came and they helped them, right? And last but not the least, uh, World War II. Unfortunately, when the Nazis, when they came to power in Germany, they were persecuting the Jewish people in Poland, in, uh, in Germany, in different places. Out of the fear, many of the Christian countries, they started to hand over the Jewish people to the Nazis, but all the Muslim countries, they made this pact, saying that we are going to write false documents for, uh, for the Jews, saying that, you know what, Jews are our people, they are our citizens, and they are one of us. Not a single Muslim country handed over Jewish people to the Nazis. 75,000 Jewish people, they were saved by Turkey. 2,000 people, they were saved by Iran. And Kosovo and Bosnia and, uh, and all the rest of the Muslim countries combined, more than 
were thousand Jewish people that were protected from being uh, persecuted and being killed by the Nazis. So looking, looking into this history, a Jewish scholar by the name of Dr. David Morenstein, he said, so he wrote an article in the Jewish Journal, right? And you can, this is your, also your homework for you, by the way. He wrote an article in the JC.com. This came in the May of 2012. And the title of the article was this. So what did the Muslims did for the Jews? And the very first sentence he wrote down is Islam saved the Jewish. So if anyone says to you that Muslims are out there, enemies of the Jewish people, and want to kill the Jewish people? No, look at this. A Jewish scholar is saying that every single time the Jewish people were persecuted, Islam gave them home and the land and the freedom and saved them from extinction. If not for the Muslims, he's saying, the Jewish people would be extinct. All right. So, I will end with this. What are the five step plans for peace? Brother Dale had went over the history, academic point of view, from the lobbying point of view. I went over some theology, some history. But you know, we are here not only to uh, not only to get educated, but there should be an action plan for us, a call to action, right? So this is my call to action. It's a five-step plan, and I hope all of you agree with that. Even if you don't, we can have a good, you know, dynamic uh, session of engagement. God willing. First and foremost. I would say that the foundation has to be correct. That means every single human should take other human as equal. You know, there is a passage in the Quran, chapter number 5, verse number 32. It says that taking one, saving one human life is like saving the life of all of humanity. Then it says that saving one human life or taking one human life it's like taking the life of all of humanity. So over here, God is not saying that the life of a Muslim. It's saying that every life is equal, every soul is precious, and every blood is sacred. So that is the very first principle, and there is no exception to it, all right? Once we start taking exception, the other side will also take exception. So that's step number one of the five steps. The second step would be condemnation has to be equal. We cannot take any sides, because if we take the side of any country, any people, any culture, any group, saying that, you know, we will condemn this group, but not that other group, if you do that, that means you don't believe in uh, the principle or the premise of number one, that all life is equal. So condemnation has to be equal, it doesn't matter who's compromising innocent life. So that's step number two. Step number three would be, occupied people, they have the right to resist. They have the right to fight back. You know, for that reason, we praise Gandhi. For that reason, we praise uh, Nelson Mandela for his uh, fight against apartheid. For that reason, many of the, many of the Americans were sending billions of dollars to Ukraine because we always want to support the oppressed people. So they have the right to resist and to fight back. However, point number four is connected with point number three. That in that fair and just, you know, war, there has to be some guidelines. You know, Islam has given guidelines in every walk of life, so the guidelines, even in a just war, would be these. First and foremost, no non-combatant should be uh, harmed, should be killed. So, life is sacred, non-combatants, they cannot be compromised. So that is one important principle. Second important principle is that even if an enemy comes and harms your civilian population, even then Islam does not give Muslims the right to harm their civilian population. That means, uh, uh, so that means, without exception by the way, right? If we start taking exception that you know one, one group, they have, uh, they, they have the right to defend themselves, that means what about the other group? If we are allowing one, one group to throw bombs at other groups, saying that they want to destroy the tunnels and whatnot, that means they are taking exceptions to these principles. Once you take exceptions, then you cannot condemn the other side when they are taking exceptions. So these are some of the guidelines, by the way, right? You cannot take away the, the fuel and the medicine and the water and the food 
even from the enemy population. And these are the principles coming from the Quran and the authentic example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We cannot destroy hospitals and the schools and the shelters of the civilians. And then Islam says in chapter 8, Quran says in chapter 8, verse number 61, if the enemy lays down their weapons, Muslims are supposed to also lay down their weapons, shake hands, sign a peace treaty, do not shoot in the back. Chapter 8 of the Quran, verse number 61 says that, right? And then last but not the least, number 5, is that both parties should be compelled to obey international law, right? What is international law? There should be immediate cease fire and the lifting of the blockade. No exceptions to it, right? No exceptions to it. No exceptions to it. Point number five also says that the right of return of every single Palestinian who were kicked out in the Nakba in 1948, them and their progeny. Who says this? Not me, as a Muslim. UN resolutions that says that. All right. UN resolutions that say that every single one of them, they have the right to return. But let me take a pause really quickly over here. If I find out that some Jews, if they were kicked out from the Muslim land, I would exactly say the same thing standing over here. Believe me. Islam is not about the rights of Muslims only, by the way. Islam is about rights of every single human. So that's a really important point. Every single hostage who are civilians, they have to be free from both sides. We just, can't, we just cannot stand up for the hostage of only one side. It has to be equality. If we don't do this, that means we don't believe in premise number one. That means every single life is equal. And the next one is that every single Jewish settlement, according to the US resolution, every single one of them, they are illegal, they all have to go. Every single one of them. Who is saying this? You know, the fourth Geneva Convention, and I have cited over here. Occupation has to end. Occupation is the key to the chaos that we see. So Nelson Mandela, he said, our freedom is incomplete if Palestine is not free. And then last but not the least, but therefore I will end with this inshallah, there should be a war crime tribunals. And in there, there should be fair lawyers and both sides should be, uh, should be uh, placed on the stand, and if any person, any group, right, any minister, even the prime minister of any country, if they are held responsible for killing any one single human, they should be persecuted with the highest extent of the law, so no one will do it in the future. So, just to wrap up, occupation leads to fighting and resistance, and justice leads to peace. So I hope and pray, when we see each other as equal, when we do justice to each other as equal, when we have accountability with the guidance of God in front of us, that's when we can, inshallah, God willing, establish societies which are away from racism, away from anti-Semitism, away from Islamophobia, and they would be societies based upon unity, based upon morality, based upon justice, and the outcome would be nothing less than peace. May God guide us all and may God bless us all. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a lot of good information. It's like when you have good food and you eat very fast, faster than you can swallow. Inshallah, we are going to have an open session now with question and answer. Ask your question, but then let us know which uh, speaker you want to answer your question. We'll spend about 20 minutes or so. Thank you. So if there are any text cards here and pencils, anybody that wants to ask a question, they are supposed to be picking up an index card and writing the question and directing the question to a specific speaker. So if you want to ask questions, you have the index card. Oh, thank you. So please.
I'm going to try to read this. <laughs> In which ways can we pressure politicians, government to make change changes? What can we do to to make efforts? to counteract efforts of Israeli interest groups. So, question for Dave. Okay. How do I counter the pressure of Israeli groups? Right. It, it's a really good question, and I guess, right, to rephrase it, right? Do you fight fire with fire, right? <laughs> and the last one, you know, should pro-Palestine groups start to raise money organized the way that pro-Israel groups do. It, it's a mixed bag, right? Because, like I said, lobbying is part of how this country works. If you want your voice heard in Washington, you have to vote, and you also have to call your congressman, and you have to give money, right? There was a very bleak study uh, conducted by, I forgot but by who, but some university. And it basically concluded that you know the power of lobbyists versus the power of the citizens was almost like 99.9999% to one. I think that's a little cynical, and it's just from my firsthand experience of you know living in DC and having friends who work in congressional offices. But I think the general kind of tone of that statement is true. Um, so yeah, I, I I do think political organizing is part of it. I think the more and donations um, I, to candidates. I think the more complicated part of that is in terms of other tactics, right, that you use. Um, the kind of the heavy-handed tactics, right? John Mearsheimer calls it smash-mouth politics, basically, which is, involves lots of bullying. You know, I discussed my right, laws, you know, seeking to limit people's freedom of speech, seeking to silence people, and I think that's a bad tactic, right? I don't think people looking to advocate for a more nuanced U.S. foreign policy should resort to bullying or, or to bad helping people intentionally. But yeah, a lot of it just comes down to organizing and to raising money. And look, you can organize it in multiple ways. You can organize to try and change the laws about lobbying. You can organize to try and you know give more money to candidates to support Israel on the war of Palestine. I can do this. Um, but yeah. That's what I would say. Okay, thank you. Uh, Muslims help Jews all around. So why Jews are against Muslims? Sabine. Okay, so the question is, if Muslims help the Jewish people all throughout history, so how come the Jews are against the Muslims? You know, first and foremost, we cannot paint all the Jewish people with the brush that they are the ones responsible for what is going on, the genocide right now. Only a few people who have the Zionist mentality, they are the ones doing it. Right? So I would say that there's so much a geopolitical situation which is going on and unfortunately our actions or the actions of some Jewish people are a product of their situation. Secondly, the Jewish people, many of them, they may not be educated with the realities and the history which I showed up there. So because of that ignorance and because of uh, you know, the current Jewish, uh, the current situation, it could be that reason that some Jewish people they don't appreciate the wonderful ways that Muslims and the Jews and the Christians and the people of other faiths, how they live in harmony and peace and justice with each other. So I would say education is the key. Before we go with the next question important, the summary of my, my presentation is in the card like this, right? So they are out there in the lobby uh, on the table. So you can take it. The first part speaks about uh, the history which I went over and then the theology. And then the five-step plan that I went over is there in the back. So you can take it for your own knowledge, your own resource, and your own notes. Secondly, there is also a good book that our organizers, they have given over here. Uh, so I want to give all of them a big hand, the Islamic Foundation of Peoria. <laughs> for the leadership and for the volunteers. So they printed this book called The uh, Forcing God's Hand. It also goes over some of the context of the current situation and the history of the lobbying and what we can uh, you know, learn and the call to action. So for the guests, every single book is free, by the way, up there, right? For all the guests. Thank you.
Okay, this is for uh, Ale. What is Christian Zionism in the light of biblical verses? I, uh, and which church is promoted? I think the related question is, uh, is it, is, is the, are there any Christian Zionists in the U.S. more than the Jews in the world? Also, is Zionism anti-Semitic? Okay. <laughs> right. All right. So, what is Christian Zionism in light of biblical verses, and which church is promoted? Right. So, now you'll find Christian Zionism predominantly amongst evangelicals, right, and mega churches, right. So. Yeah, so it's going to be amongst kind of more non-denominational evangelical uh, kind of groups is where you're more likely to see it. Now you'll see it, of course, bleed into all sort of sects of Christianity on an informal basis, right? So you'll hear pastors in more Baptist, evangelical, non-denominational churches of certain ilks promoted from the pulpit, right? But because of the abundance of information these days, you'll have people who are, you know, maybe Episcopalians or Catholics who will subscribe to it. Their, their priests or their, you know, spiritual leader aren't necessarily preaching it from the pulpit. Their churches don't necessarily teach it, but they'll kind of come across it in some shape and come to believe it. Uh, so that's kind of where we see Christian Zionism uh, taking root in the country. And of course, geographically, it's more likely to be in, like, you know, in the Deep South and, and stuff like that. But of course, it's it's all over in some, in some shape or form. Um, are there more Christian Zionists in the U.S. than the Jews in the world? I haven't crunched the numbers on that, but I would assume so, just because you know Christians <laughs> think about you know it's a big country and it's a Christian majority country and what Jewish population in the U.S. is about two percent and of course not all Jews are Zionists. That's also very important to point out here. Um, but yeah, so number-wise, there's probably more Christian Zionists uh, than Jewish Zionists. It's also important to note that Christian Zionism, according to some studies, almost predates Jewish Zionism, right? If you look into the Schofield Bible, which I'm not an expert on, but that's kind of the basis of kind of, you know, early 18th, 1800s, stuff like that, Christians kind of developing ideas of uh, a Jewish return to the Holy Land. Uh, is Zionism anti-Semitic? Um, I'm not an expert on anti-Semitism, but it can be. I'll say that. <laughs> I'll cop out kind of, right? It depends how you practice those things, right? So for instance, right, Christ, a lot of Christian Zionists, again, especially in the early days, wanted Jews to go back to Palestine because they wanted to get rid of Jews in their own country. <laughs> right? So it, it could have very, very, very deeply anti-Semitic overtures. But there are also Christian Zionists who genuinely, you know, and again, not necessarily the end times Christian Zionists, but there are those who just think, you know, they're God's favorite people, God loves them, he wants them to be living in land in milk and honey and peace and prosperity. So it depends on their motivations. They can be, they can be anti-Semitic, but they're not necessarily anti-Semitic. This is for Sabine, Dr. Sabine. Forgiving is important and necessary, but how do you forgive a genocide? There's a big part. Oh, what? So the question is, forgiveness is necessary, but how do you forgive genocide? So I don't think I mentioned that, you know, just forgive it uh, and, you know, let 30,000 people, maybe 40,000, you know, people in the rubble too, combine together. I'm not saying forgiveness. Justice has to be brought. Justice has to be done. Because Islam, yes. There is some forgiveness because if we all, if everyone keeps on forgiving every single person all the time, that means that creates a loophole for the evil people to commit the sin. Oppression is going to continue, and obviously injustice is going to happen. So forgiveness has a time and a place, but in this case, yes, people have to be brought into justice. Uh, and Islam is about uh, not pacifism but about peaceful existence. So to obtain peace, we have to bring justice. Justice means people who have committed wrong, they have to be brought on the trial. This is for uh, Dale. He said, lobbying seems like bribing, political bribes. Why is it allowed even? <laughs> it is bribing. <laughs> and it's allowed because the Supreme Court <laughs> lets it happen, uh, uh, Citizen United case, right? 
Right, and it's, a, it's a good line, right? So you'll you'll see Senator Bob Menendez right now is uh, facing serious charges of accepting foreign bribes from Egypt, basically because he took bribes in the wrong form, right? He didn't let Americans donate him money through a nonprofit PAC to support his campaign. He took bribes from halal businessmen in Egypt, gold and cars and all sorts of strange stuff. Um, but yeah, so that's basically the difference. It's basically just a legal matter of how you're getting your money. Is it domestic money being funneled through proper campaign channels, or is it happening in more sinister, under the radar, illegal ways? David, again, what is the source of the 58 billion in Israeli lobby funds? And can organizations like ACLU challenge that anti BDS law and um, Congress? Uh, I saw that and I'm glad it was asked because I looked it up again. I just spoke. It's 15 million, not billion. There's lots of millions and billions in all of this, okay? 15 million. But I want to be clear that's 15 million is the amount of money given through official PACs and super PACs and campaign contributions. There's also what's called dark money, which is basically money that is. So, a quick rundown, right? PACs, an individual can give $5,000 or less to a PAC for a certain candidate. That PAC can give money to a candidate, and it's all tracked. Super PACs, money can be given by individuals or by corporations of unlimited amounts. That is tracked, but that money can't go to a candidate, unlike like regular PAC money can. That money will be used on mailers, commercials, stuff like that. Dark money is money given to a nonprofit group, usually, that also comes out in ways such as commercial stuff like that, but those groups can't give a majority of the funds they get from donors, can't spend the majority of those funds on campaign ads, right? So, if, you know, and they just have very strange names, right? So you'll see like, you know, Foundation for a Better America, that doesn't exist, but just as a type, you know, an example, right? And they'll run an ad against someone. That's, that would probably be a dark money group. And again, in their tax filing, they'll probably have to show that they spend, you know, 60% of their money you want feeding the homeless and 40% running ads again so and that's the difference and that money isn't tracked right so you don't know and that's why a lot of money gets sent uh, to dark money groups so the 50 billion is just the trackable money in packs and super packs it's not all the money that goes to untraceable dark money and I just want to give another number and this one is a billion um, so the total constellation this money this um, by the way, sorry, the 58 million number comes from a Guardian analysis by the Guardian, just to, to clear that up. This other stat comes from the Institute for Research Middle Eastern Policy, and it's a couple of years old now, and I couldn't get an updated one. But so the nonprofit Israel Affinity Organization, kind of annual money that they raise and spend. So that doesn't include campaigns, that includes, you know, friends of the IDF or raising money for settlements, right? So just the whole pro Israel network not even involved in campaigns. They have annual revenues that reach 6.2 billion. Okay, so that's just another statistic for you for the whole kind of pro-Israel network. Okay, again for Dale. Dale is Catholic, by the way. So he said, "Do you think Catholic churches are much less supportive of Zionism? <laughs> if so, how can they be pushed against Christian Zionist churches?" Now that question is from somebody who is doing major in political science. <laughs> Okay, so. Yeah, so again, generally speaking, the Catholic Church, again, it's not going to preach uh, Christian Zionism. Uh, again, it will creep in amongst its members. The Church has an interesting relationship, right, with, with the State of Israel. It's not afraid to criticize the State of Israel. You've seen the current Cardinal Archbishop of Jerusalem. I can't pronounce his name, it's like pizza something. <laughs> Right, um, make very strong statements, for instance, when Israel bombed the Holy Family Church, the only Catholic church in Gaza. Um, they also bombed the Orthodox Church there. The Pope has spoken out in very harsh terms, really, about um, what Israel has done in Gaza in recent months. Uh, when he went on his visit uh, to the Holy Land a couple years ago, you know, he visited, he made a point to go to Bethlehem to kind of put his hand on, on the separation wall or the apartheid wall and to pray in front of it. Uh, so, but at the same time, you know, the church does take a very, it's very careful how it criticizes, right? So you'll see certain major denominations 
in the US that are very willing to criticize Israel, like, they'll pass resolutions supporting BDS and stuff like that. The Catholic Church doesn't really operate like that. It, it tends to take much more, yeah, it'll say, it'll say things, but it's not gonna really take action on these things, and that's for a lot of reasons, right? They still wanna have access to Israel. They don't wanna get kicked out. You know, the church is a sacramental church, it's tangible. They want to be there to minister uh, to people. They wanna be, kind of what you're saying, kind of an instrument of peace to kind of broker, broker these kind of things. Um, how can they be uh, pitched against Christian Zionism? Yeah, but I think, and this is the problem, again, the Catholic Church is that you're not going to really hear about it. The Catholic Church isn't going to support Zionism, but if you go into a Catholic Church on Sunday, you're not going to hear a sermon condemning what Israel is doing in Gaza. So it's, it's, it's kind of a middle ground there. Two parts, this question for Dave. Can you tell, it's not clear, but can you tell what is Palestine borders? So I don't know if you're asking what Palestine borders with what countries or what are the borders or boundaries of the Palestine. Second part is, do you believe what is taken by force doesn't come back only with force? Right, okay. So yeah, Israel, this is important just to note as a fact, Israel does not have declared borders, it has borders that it enforces, <laughs> but no internationally recognized borders, right? So it has the annex Golan Heights from Syria in the north, which Donald Trump acknowledged as being Israeli territory, which Joe Biden has not retracted, but has no international standing. It's just US policy, but that doesn't change international law. Of course, you see this most relevantly in the West Bank, where settlements pop up, and there's just you know the Swiss cheese reality of the West Bank. And so, yeah, even Israel would say it doesn't have defined borders. They would say that's a final solution matter, uh, final status issues matter. So yeah, and it, it's important to know, right? Because again, you'll see headlines, right? Be like, you know, violence on Israel's northern border and all that stuff. But what is its actual borders? You know, that's that's a question. What was the second part of that question? Oh yeah. What doesn't come in, what is taken by force doesn't come back with force. Mm -hmm. Do I believe that? Well, depends. I mean, <laughs> look, yeah, it, it's a tough question, you know, because you, know, you, you cited Gandhi, right? And he was certainly committed to nonviolence in terms of, you know, injustices that he saw. But we also talk about the international right to, to resist. So, you know, it really, you know, I think that's more of a question you gotta dig deep inside and, and think through. Okay. So I think there's one way of uh, taking it back without force would be impacting the American public opinion through this kind of educational institution. But I think because American foreign policy has a much greater role in imposing that kind of right. So it could be a non-army uh, right. way, non-military uh, way right. to do this. Right, so I guess I would say, yeah. It could definitely, the US government is not forceful with Israel at all, right? You'll see, and a lot of people have talked about this with the Gaza war. You'll see like, it seems like once every two weeks or so, you see a statement saying, Joe Biden, talked to Benjamin Netanyahu and expressed how exasperated he is with what they're doing, right? But then nothing ever changes policy-wise. They'll say that, and then in the next sentence, it'll be the State Department has given more ammunition to Israel and has bypassed Congress to do so, right? And so it, it's just, the U.S., like, and it, this is nothing new, right? Even in times of peace, the U.S. will send a statement being like, Israel has announced more settlements, we're concerned about that, and we condemn it, right? And then the money keeps on going to Israel. So it's not forceful at all towards Israel. And again, I think, and the Israel lobby likes to claim that such criticisms, right, are kind of anti-Semitic because these kind of criticisms single out the state of Israel for criticism, right? And kind of a way to fight back against that is to say, actually, Israel is getting special treatment, right? It's, we hold, even Egypt, right, gets some money taken out of its foreign budget for human rights violations, and rightfully so. But you don't see that happening with Israel. In fact, the Senate just voted this week against the Bernie Sanders resolution to launch a report into Israeli human rights violations on the basis of foreign aid. 
right? So why do we do those investigations for Egypt against aid, but not Israel? So Israel seems to be singling itself out for special treatment, not necessarily its critics. And its critics are responding to the special treatment it gets, not the other way around. So, so this question for Dr. C.B. Uh, what verses of Old Testament do Zionist Jews quote, and what verses do non-Zionist Jews quote? And uh, that's it. Okay, so the question is, what verses of the Bible do the Zionists they use for their own agenda, and those who are opposing the uh, opposing Zionism, what verses they use from the Bible? So I'm a Muslim speaker, not a biblical scholar. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I will act like one today. Uh, some of the verses of the Old Testament, uh, the Zionists that they use, one of them would be from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 3, in which the army led by Joshua, the Jewish army, God commanded them to take over all of Palestine and to kill every single person in there. The men, the women, the children, the infants, the donkeys, and the animals. So they say, you know what, the whole land belongs to us. Anyone who is living, uh, living up there in Palestine, it is fair for us because God gave this land to the Jewish people. And then they also use uh, passages from the book of Genesis, the very first book, saying that uh, you know, God made prophecies, especially to Isaac, and that this land belongs only to the people of Israel, to the children of Israel, right? So there are many such passages used by the Zionists. But the passages people use for opposing Zionism, they say that there are equally number of prophecies in which God has said that Abraham's descendants are going to inhabit this land. And the descendants of Abraham is not just the descendants from Isaac, they are also descendants from Ishmael. That means the land, according to the Bible, according to the God of the Bible, belongs both to the Arabs and to the Jewish people, according to the Bible. Those who are opposing Zionism in this genocide, they cite passages from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse number 3, and these are the Ten Commandments. One of the commandments says that you should not murder, or you should not kill, right? And there is no exception to that law, by the way. So people, they pick and choose, they cherry picking, as we say, to say that you know God is a real estate agent and God has given a whole of Palestine, not just Palestine by the way, from Euphrates all the way to Niles. They say that greater Israel belongs only to the Jewish people. Ultimately the Bible itself refutes that, saying that God's blessing came for all the descendants of Ishmael and especially of, uh, of Abraham. That means all the people, especially also the Arab people. <coughs> Okay, we have uh, <coughs> the book we just showed, Forcing God's Hand by Grace Hillel. Uh, by the way, she was a secretary with two or three presidents. A uh, very good book, by the way. Uh, it says it's available outside and it's uh, <coughs> about the Christian Zionism, if anybody is interested. I really say, I, I, would, I would really urge you to buy it if it's available to say. Um, there is a project, I don't know, it's called Canary or Canary Project, C A N A R Y. It's by some Jewish organization. They list all the speakers who speak against it. They think are uh, anti Semitic or anti Israeli and stuff. So, this question is um, how do you challenge it? Is there anything being done to challenge it, or what do we do about it? Right, and the Canary Mission, it's, it's really. Yeah, it's a really serious issue, right? Because they go kind of after the most vulnerable people in advocacy, which tends to be college students, right? Because college students are they? They're they're looking out. They're about to start a career. They're about to start a life, right? They're in college. They want to get a job, and they're applying for a job. So it Google's their name, and the first thing that comes up is some a profile calling them anti-Semitic, right? And you have to remember that. A lot of people don't have the depth of knowledge, right? A hiring manager at a random bank or wherever is not going to be like, oh, the Canary Mission. I know that they're funded by pro-Israel interests and they have an agenda. So it, it's a huge, huge, huge problem, right? And it does, another thing it does, it, it, it kind of pits people at their worst moments, right? So, and it avoids the context, right? So someone, say, you know, just had their family killed in Gaza, right? 
and they go in a fit of rage, say something. Maybe they didn't even really want to say on Twitter. You know, maybe even something that kind of they would regret later, or maybe not. But like, and then it, it, you know, it clings up to that forever, right? And it just it gives it's really it's a, it's a real problem. In terms of fighting back against it, you know, there's not much you can really do about. I'm not a lawyer. I'm sure at least. Because a lot of it is just, I'm sure, you know, they're, what they're saying is not necessarily untrue, right? They'll cite their sources, they'll pin a tweet, they'll pin, you know, a video of something, but it'll be taken again out of context and that kind of thing. And it's and the thing is, you see, it really does give people reservation about speaking out. We get a lot of times, just at our organization, like, we'll go out and cover a rally or something like that, quote someone as saying something, and then we'll get an email from them saying, Hey, can you take my name off my website because you know I'm trying to apply for jobs or I'm you know trying to travel to Palestine and I want to get through Israeli security and I don't want you know I don't want my name out there to just the statement. They're not rejecting the statement. They're not refuting it. They just don't want the world to know what they believe in that in a Google searchable way, fearing for their safety or fearing for their profession ability or their ability to visit family abroad. Okay, there is a question here. How will how will the masjid be divided between the Jewish temple and the Muslim mosque if a two-state solution is agreed by both parties? Uh, the theologians and the and the archaeologists and the legal experts they all have to get together to find out that if there is a two-state solution. How would the Masjid al-Aqsa, uh, where would the Jewish temple be established up there? Right? Uh, I mean, I would say that by the wailing wall, there's a big space up there. So surely, you know, if every both sides agree, there can be a Jewish temple established next to the Masjid, next to the mosque up there. You know, they have taken a survey of the Muslims in all of Palestine. And according to the majority of the respondents, they say there should be only one state in which the Muslims, the Jews, the Christians, people of all faiths, no faith, they should have equal rights. That's the sentiments of the Muslims, and that's, resonate, that's resonating from the Quran. That every single person should have equal rights, equality, and justice. And that's what the Muslims, they want in there and all around the world. But Dave, how many Palestinian hostages are in prison by Israel? Right, uh, it's in the thousands, right, of political prisoners uh, being held by Israel, uh, including eight thousand. Eight thousand, yeah, and it's you know, and even in the most recent uh, ceasefire deal they had uh, late last year, right, as part of that, a whole bunch of Palestinian political prisoners were released, and what happened? About an equal or greater number were arrested again within days or maybe even hours, right? And so it's just, it's an, and it's everyone, it's children. There's a couple hundred children in Israeli detention, right? And these children report all sorts of violence against them, including, in some cases, sexual violence against them. They're held, you know, in dark, dank buses or trucks, blindfolded, interrogated, forced to sign statements in Hebrew that they don't understand, not access to a lawyer, held in indefinite detention. So yeah, it's it's a real, and these are all you know again acknowledged by our government. You'll find it in State Department reports. You know, there's a group, Defense for Children International, that documents all of this stuff. Um, right. Yeah. 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 That too. Right. And it's yeah. So it's just it's it's a it's a huge huge problem. And again, it's how does the media report on that, right? You know, every day you turn on the news and you hear about the hostages being held in Gaza, right? And I'm no fan of, for instance, holding a 10-month-old baby hostage in Gaza. <laughs> but at the same time, we you never, ever, ever, ever hear the U.S. media talk about the vastly higher number of Palestinians, including children, also being held and tortured, you know, by Israel. And uh, Josh Paul, the State Department. Uh, Representative recently resigned, talked about this recently on CNN, 
um, you know, in terms of, you know, again, the sexual assault issue. Basically, we, you know, we went to this, you know, high-ranking State Department officials with concerns about sexual assault of Palestinian children, and the response was basically like, well, you know, we'll, we'll raise the issue, you know, and you don't see that, you know, when there's reports of sexual assault going the other way, they are, you know, they're given lots and lots and lots of leeway. Okay, this question, either kind of both can answer. So is there any way to open a dialogue between Muslims and Christian Zionists? Is there any way we can open a dialogue and have some conflict? Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's always, it depends again where you are, right? I don't think there's necessarily much point to talking to people who are completely close minded. But. Again, like I said, there's different levels of Christian Zionists, right? And I think those who are, there are some who are more open-minded, right? There, are, you have to remember, like, a lot of these, again, maybe come from smaller communities in the South where they just, they haven't encountered Muslims, they haven't encountered Palestinians. They may not even know that, you know, Palestinians include Christians, right? They may not know by supporting Zionism, they're supporting a country that has bombed churches, a country that arrests, uh, you know, arrests and detains Christians. So that, that would obviously be a good starting point, right? To talk about Christians in Palestine, right? And some of their own testimonies of what life is like under occupation. Um, and from there, you can have a dialogue. Um, and I think more generally, just, you know, finding ways of common interest, right? You can, if someone's more of a fiscal conservative, again, you can, enter with the why are we wasting money on this foreign aid, right? There is that small contingent of like in the US government, right? The Thomas Massey from Kentucky kind of libertarian vein of, you know, I support Israel, but I don't want to fund them. So there are there are openings, you know, to discussing these matters. And you shouldn't be afraid to use it. It doesn't hurt to try. That's what I would say. You know, we have been here for close to about two hours. So the call to action that I would suggest each single one of you is this. So let me just start with a quotation. And obviously you heard this quotation many, many times. That if you, if you don't stand for something, you will fall for everything. Alright? So it's important that us as humans, as conscious humans, we have to stand up for the human rights. No matter who this human, human rights are supporting. We have to fight and we have to support the oppressed people. No matter who the oppressed people are. Right now, 30,000 innocent people, they have been murdered up there. So, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he said, and please, please listen to this quote carefully, he said that you should be ashamed of dying if you are not winning for humanity. You know, us as humans, we just cannot be oblivious to the tragedies which are going on around the world. Human conscious, it says that we have to stand up for something. Because I, I don't want to regret on the day of judgment or on my deathbed that what am I doing when these tragedies were going on. So our human conscious dictates that we, we have to stand up for the oppressed people. So what can you do? Some of the things that you and I, that what we can do. We can join the rallies and the protests, number one. We can also uh, uh, bypass some of those companies which are supporting the genocide which are up there. We can use the social media, it is so effective by the way, right? Use the social media to voice your opinion against the oppression. Also try to call public officials, your senators, your congressmen, your governors. Call them, put pressure on them because our tax money is going over there. So I hope and pray that once enough, one, enough people are uh, you know, awakened against the tragedies, I would say, inshallah, the game is over. May God help us and may God uh, thank us and may God bless us. Thank you very much. So there are some also free copies of the Quran out there. You know, there are verses about the Jewish people, the Christians and the Muslims and the prophets in there. You can obtain this. This is free up there. And also a book about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dr. thank you for your time and patience. Um, if anybody wants to become an activist in any area of their choice, either meet us now or contact us later. Jazakallah, thank you very much.